diabetes practically all of his life, and he has bouts with it. Had one the other day. But God's blessed him. He doesn't complain. He just goes right on to the Lord. If you have your Bible, turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 3 for with me this morning, please. 2 Timothy 3. Get that in one hand and 2 Timothy 1 in the other. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse 15. Now the apostle puts it in context in verse 14 by saying, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now note carefully, this is very important. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray you would anoint the messenger, Lord, and your word as it goes forth. I know it will not return into thee void. It will accomplish that which you please, and it will prosper in the thing whereto you sent it. In thy name I pray, amen. If you'll notice that the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, the most important part about Scripture is that it will make you wise into salvation. That's important, very important. Now, Scripture also is an historical book. It tells you the creation of the Almighty up until the present. It is definitely his, set in the historicity, the context of historicity. It is accurate right down to the jot and tittle. No question about that. Where it addresses science, it is accurate. Where it addresses uh, the relationship of men with men, it's accurate. Where it, relates, where it directs the relationship of Israel with the other nations, it's right on. No question about that. But the main purpose of the Word of God is to make you wise unto salvation. And if you read the Bible and miss that part, you have missed it all. Note carefully, when the Apostle Paul said this to young Timothy, the only scripture that could be that he was referring to was Matthew, I mean Genesis, through Malachi. New Testament hadn't been written. So the Old Testament scriptures can make you wise unto salvation. So this morning I'm going to be addressing most of what I preach to the young people, to our teenagers. We've got a lot of them in this church. And um, I grew up in church. Uh, from one church to the other, I went to vacation Bible school when I was just a kid. And uh, all of these things I experienced as a boy. And sometimes adults take things for granted that they should not. So I want to talk to the young people this morning. Now, make no mistake, what I'm saying to them, you can certainly glean from. Because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's tough growing up in church. It's tough. Say, how so? You go to Sunday school. You go to vacation Bible school. You go to camps. You go to revivals. Afterglows, meetings. All kinds of different things that we have in church. You have interaction with each other, where you're talking to each other. Then you have your parents. You're growing up in church and you're hearing Christian cliches all the time. You're learning the ropes. You know the lingo. You've seen the professions of faith. You're watching adults. Kids aren't stupid. They watch adults. And they watch them very carefully. Why? Because they have no past. To go, to go, to, they have no foundation that is of any length. And so they're watching their environment. And they're learning. And they're learning things sometimes that they should not learn. The Bible said in 2 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 5. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith. That is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, 
and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Remember this now tonight, this morning. This is very important to understand. That Timothy grew up in a home where they believed the Bible. He had a Greek father, but he had a grandmother that was a faithful believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He had a faithful mother that had been taught by her mother the truth of God through the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that was pointing toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Timothy did not have any problem at all believing on the Son of God once that message came into his home. Now remember, folks, we're talking about a young man who grows up under the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Say, why don't you just say Judaism because there's a vast difference? And I'll get into that later. Once you begin to study the Bible and study history and the things that relate to it, as I teach in my Sunday school class, I've taught it <laughs> ad nauseum. How that the faith of Judaism, the Apostle Paul said, I profited in the Jews' religion. He's not talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's talking about the God of the Talmud. The God of rabbinic Judaism. The stuff, that's, the, the stuff that they use today to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. If you can get them to put their Talmud aside and open the Bible, you can lead them to Christ. If you can take them through from Genesis to Malachi, show them in the Scripture who the Lord Jesus is, they can be saved. But they'll pull their Talmud up. And that, my friend, is the basis of their unbelief. So the Lord said here through the Apostle Paul, Timothy, you grew up in a home that was not, you were not raised on the Talmud. You were raised on the Old Testament. And because you were raised on the Old Testament, you had no problem it was unfeigned faith, remember? The Lord said of the Pharisees, You stand on the street corners, you pray long prayers so that you might be seen. And that long prayer is your righteousness. And it, it was their righteousness. And when the Apostle Paul got saved, he said, I'm not come to the Lord, and I paraphrase him, I'm not coming to the Lord with my righteousness, but I'm coming in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He learned that there was a standard much higher than anything you could ever do for righteousness. So, you, you're growing up. You go to Sunday school, you go to vacation Bible school, you go to camp, you go to, you go to church activities, revivals, meetings, interaction with friends. There's nothing wrong with these things. The attempt during all of this is to try to get the Word of God over to you. It's trying to plant it in your heart and in your soul. This is why I say this morning I'm trying to address young people with this message. Parents. Some of your parents care. They care, they care for your soul. They love you. They want you to be saved. But you cannot take a child and ram it down their throat. It won't work. It won't work. It won't work. It won't work. You can't do it that way. Remember, Timothy, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. No doubt in my mind, no doubt in my mind that Timothy heard his grandmother reading the Old Testament. He heard his mother read the Old Testament. He heard them probably as they, as they talked about it, as they, as, they, as they asked questions about it and prayed. No doubt he saw Eunice and he saw Lois on their knees before God calling upon the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. The God of Israel is who they called upon. And he no doubt was raised in an atmosphere like that. That nurtured this young man. Everything good that he needed was given to him by his family. Amen. And that's what you want. That's exactly what we want. We want parents in this house who care for their children. They love their children. They want to teach their children the truth. They will put them in a Bible-believing church where the Word of God is preached and taught and witnessed and ministered in all the fashions. Some parents don't care though. Some of you couldn't care less. And there are those watching by that will watch this later and that will watch v DVDs of it and all this. They don't care. Some of them want to get rid of you. They want to get you out of the house, out of the way, out of half under their feet. They don't care about you. 
They couldn't care less. Some support you and encourage you. Some of your parents sacrifice for you. They'll run out of their way for you because they love you. If you don't have the love of a parent, you start out bad in this world. If you don't have. Some parents place everything in the world before the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll put ball games, fishing, hunting, everything under the sun before the church of God. If you got your kid playing ball and it conflicts with Sunday, get something else for them to do. So I don't like that preacher, well, I'm telling you the truth. Get something else for them to do. Because you're conflicting with the church of God. They need that spiritual food more than they need a ball game. And folks, I played basketball. I lived it for years. As much an athlete as any of them. But friend, I'm going to tell you something. There's more in this world than a ball game. Or, a, or, or judo or whatever. <laughs> Don't put it before Christ. Teach them that the church is important. Teach them that the church of God is important. If you don't have the church, it's the pillar and ground of the truth. All of these peripheral things out here depend entirely on the church of the living God. Amen. Amen. Kids are smart. They are. Parent, uh, pastor's kids watch the way church people treat their dad. They know what kind of life their dad lives. Whether it's real or fake. They know the ropes. If they get into trouble, they can run to the altar. Everything's okay. How many of you kids ever played your parents like that? Don't have to raise your hand. But you got messed up. And you knew, well, I know what I'll do. <laughs> I'll walk the aisle and I'll get down in that altar and I'll cry a few tears and everything will be just fine. It may work a little bit. But your parents aren't stupid either. They'll watch you. And after a few trips to the altar, getting right with God, and then going right back to the same thing again, they're going to say, Ah, oh, so you're just playing me. You're just playing me. You're just playing me. They know all the church talk. They know how to act spiritual. Kids that grow up in church, I marvel at how they can turn the tears on. And they can turn them off. You ever been around people that can turn them on turn them off? Those tears are supposed to mean something. They're supposed to mean something. Tears an indication of somebody may be able to control things more than they should. Some folks live and die on their emotion. And let me tell you something about emotion. Emotion's all right. It's good at times in the right place. But don't live by it. It'll kill you. Your emotions will suck the life out of your soul. Because you're going to be constantly looking for something to keep you, keep your emotions, keep your emotions going. You can't do it because it won't work. So they learn the church talk. Then one day we pray, young people, that you come face to face with God. I want you to be saved. I want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been where you are. I was 27 when I was saved. I've been where you are. I came through all of it. I want you to be saved. We're not going to put a number on the wall back there. Nobody's going to send a newsletter out telling everybody how many we got saved at Temple. We're not going to use you for fodder in our religious canon. What we will do is respect you and work with you and help you if we can and answer the questions that we can answer. But we will most of all give you the truth so that you know, you know, you know that you've been born of the Spirit of God. That's all I care about. I quit going to the pastor's meetings 40 years ago over here in the hospitals. <laughs> I'd go in there to visit, and they've got a room where the pastors would meet. And, I, I, you know, a lot of pastors would never divulge something I'm about to give you, but I'm going to tell you the truth because I've, I've never belonged to anybody's clique. They kicked me out a long time ago. I went in there. I was young, hadn't been pastoring long. 
And man, you never heard as much bragging in your life as went on inside that place. Well, we had this many Sunday, and we did this, and we had this, and we had this, and we had that. And I thought, good night, man. I don't have to go in here. So I walked out of there one day and never went back. Never went back. It's not important. My ego is not important. <laughs> Puff, it's not, that doesn't matter. I want you to be saved. Now, the pastor's kids watch the way church people treat their dad. Parents watch the way church people treat their mom and dad. Take pastor out of there and put parents. In other words, they're watching you folks. Kids suffer from peer pressure. Young people, you suffer from peer pressure. I don't know what it's like. Because you want to be accepted. It's, 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 it's thick. Young people, when you come into your teenage years, you worry about what you look like, smell like, what you wear, where you go, who you're going with. It is, consumes your life because you want to be accepted. How many of you agree with me? <laughs> That's the truth. So if one does one thing, the rest of them do it. And you can learn how to manipulate children, young people, by getting one or two of the leaders to do something, the rest of them will follow suit. This is how you put peer pressure on young people. You pressure them into doing things. God help us, we're not going to pressure you into anything. When I was 13 years old, the pastor of the church came by, came back, walked back during the altar call, took hold of my hand, he said, Some young man, wouldn't you like to be saved? Wouldn't you like to be saved? Everybody looked at me. So I got up and I walked with him down to the, down to the altar. I got down on my knees at 13. They all gathered around. I could hear people praying all over the place. I listened to them pray. Because there wasn't anything inside me to pray. I wasn't ready. I wasn't convicted. But they all prayed. I got up. The pastor says, we'll baptize you now. We can baptize you when? Sunday night, next Sunday, whenever. And I was baptized. Thirteen years old, I was baptized into that church. Do you know what? I went in dry, came out wet, and I wasn't a bit changed. Do you know why I wasn't? God was not dealing with me. This is why we will not pressure you into conversion. Any Christian in this house that has any spiritual maturity, if got half a brain, they know that if you're not ready, no fruit is going to come of it. You're not going to be born again. If anything, they've done you a disservice. Amen. They've done you a disservice. Kids can be pressured. Mature Christians look for a move of God. The two kinds of Christians, as this text shows us, one kind is Timothy. He was nurtured in a Christian home. I, see, I use the word Christian in the sense that his faith brought him to Christ. He wasn't born into a Christian home. Eunice was not a Christian. Lois was not a Christian. These were Old Testament believing Jews that believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that laid the foundation for the coming of Christ. And when Christ showed up, they accepted him. You're following me now. Amen. Amen. So Timothy is raised in a Bible-believing church. They believe the Bible. He was nurtured. Some of you young people in here today, that's the kind of home you're in. God bless you. Hallelujah. That's the most wonderful thing in the world. Your parents, you're doing what you should do. You're nurturing them. But you're not forcing them. You're not going to... You're not going to Give them an arm lock and drag them down to the altar. That's not going to do any good. If anything, you're going to drive them out of church and away from God. Amen. So Timothy was raised like that. And the scripture says to make him wise to salvation. But how was Saul? Well, Saul of Tarsus sat at the feet. This is what he said in the book of Acts. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the grandson of Hillel. Hillel was one of the greatest sages, the greatest teachers of Judaism 2,000 years ago. And he sat at the feet of his grandson. So he got it firsthand. He got a wonderful religious education. But he didn't know God. You see, he went off to the great school that turned him into a monster. Saul of Tarsus was a monster. 
He was a murdering monster. I cannot emphasize enough this morning the vast difference between Timothy and Saul of Tarsus. Both of them came to faith in Christ. Timothy, by being nurtured into that faith, Saul of Tarsus by being shocked into that faith. Amen. And his whole world came to an end on the road to Damascus. Amen. He was shocked into it. But they both came to the same Savior. That's what's important. Your testimony is your testimony. Glory to God, tell it, sing about it, and shout from the housetops. But it may not be somebody else's testimony. We may come a thousand different ways, but we all come to the same one. Hey man, that's what's important. If you have the true faith of Christ, you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't come to the church, forget the church. You don't come to the, you know, today, this faith tradition. It's all about the faith, the faith, the faith. Well, that's a very, what's the word for that? would be a good word for that. It's just a, it's an ambiguous term. It has no real specific meaning. Faith in what? <laughs> You're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who our faith is in. That's what we're about, Son of God. All right? So what a difference there is. Saul of Tarsus was very religious and very lost. Contrast this man with a Samaritan. On the road to Jericho. Half-breed Jew. Had his own Pentateuch. Called a Samaritan Pentateuch. An ancient document that still exists by the way. At Mount Gerizim. They've got the Samaritan Pentateuch. They can lay it down next to the Mosaic Pentateuch. And they're very, very, very similar. But not exact. What does it do? It gives you credibility. It shows you there's a common origin. It shows you that the scripture's ancient. So. The Lord Jesus Christ said to the Samaritan woman at the well, Ye worship, you know not what. She said, Our fathers told us to here at Mount Gerizim is the place to worship, right? What did the Lord Jesus say to her? You worship, you know not what. For salvation is of the... But he used a Samaritan with his limited knowledge. He used a Samaritan with his limited knowledge of the truth as an example of what Christian love and faith is all about. Because he's the... Some, he's the good Samaritan that you hear about all the time. The world knows that term. All right. Contrast Saul of Tarsus that had the opportunity to sit at the feet of the greatest teacher of his age and turned him into a monster. And here we have a Samaritan that has a limited knowledge and truth of God, yet he is the one who showed real love and compassion. You are what you choose to be. In 1 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 13. Now, folks, dig in with me. I'm going to start talking to you, okay? I'm going to deal some theology with you now. 1 Timothy 1, 13. He said, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. There is no man on the face of this earth or woman who is ignorant of the fact that sin is sin. Don't, don't, don't buy that from anybody. Murder is murder. You have people that have never seen a Bible who will, who will hang you for murder. Adultery, sodomy, all this other stuff. It is innate. It's written into the heart and soul of a man. He said in the book of Romans chapter number 2. That the word of God, the morality of it is written in the soul, in the conscience of a man. So what's he talking about here? This, young people, is a lesson that I hope you get because it took me decades to get it. What I'm trying to say to you now. The Apostle Paul said, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. What does that mean, preacher? What do you mean, ignorance and unbelief? You're not ignorant of what you're doing. You're ignorant of who you are as it relates to God and the only thing that can change that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said, I was ignorant of who Christ really was. And because of that, I rejected Him. I rejected Him. And therefore, God was merciful to me. Because I was ignorant of who He was. 
He was merciful to me and allowed me to be graciously saved on the road to Damascus. I can go to John chapter number 9, John chapter number 15. I can go back where Christ said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And we can lay a foundation to you this morning that is very simple. And the Lord did forgive them, the ones who crucified Him. Because the Bible said if they had known they were crucifying the Lord of glory, they wouldn't have done it. They did it ignorantly in unbelief. Young people, you're in a church that's preaching the Word. You hear it every Sunday. You hear it all the time. You're inundated with it. It's like a flood that comes down upon your soul. The light is shining in this house so bright that some people, it blinds them. So what do you mean, preacher? Nobody makes excuses for your sins in here. Sinner's a sinner, right? Nobody's making excuses for anything. Your problem is whether you will acknowledge before God that you are guilty as a sinner, the way God sees you as a sinner. God sees you, not you see yourself. The way you see yourself is irrelevant. What does God see? God sees you as a sinner, and Christ is the salvation, the cleansing, the propitiation, the redemption, the justification for your sin. When you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, you can no longer plead ignorant. Never plead it again because you're not ignorant. The Word of God has been preached to you, and now you must give an account. The Lord told him in John 15, If I had not come and done the deeds before you that I've done, you would have no sin. He told him in John chapter number 9, He said, You say you see, therefore your sin remaineth. What sin? Not that we're sinners. We're all sinners. What's the sin? The sin is rejecting what God says that you are and rejecting the propitiation or the one who died to change you from what you are, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do that, your eyes are wide open. That is your condemnation. This is what John's Gospel is all about. This is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light. Can a 17-year-old understand that? You better believe you can. 16, 15, 14, 13, 12. On down the line until it gets to that point where only God knows how much that child can understand. And that's what we call the age of accountability. And that varies from one child to the next. So you've been told this morning that your accountability to God is not for what you've done. It's for who you are. And that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who can change who you are. And when you reject Him, you've rejected the light. And you're turned to darkness. That's salvation. Salvation is not a formula. There's a lot of people think, well, I can lead them down this road. Find, find a thousand roads in the Bible. That road doesn't save anybody. Every book in the Bible can be used to get somebody saved. Salvation is not a formula. Salvation is a person. And either you receive and trust and embrace that person or you reject him. Now let me give you the foundation of it. Here's the basis. Here's, here's, here's the bottom line. Either you trust God or you don't. It's that simple. You say, I can't trust anybody. Well, I'm not going to criticize you for that. I trust very few. I don't even trust myself. I know the old man. <laughs> when I get down and get in the closet somewhere and get a hold of God, and there for a little while I'm walking with the Lord and communing with Him and fellowshipping with Him and praying for God to give me some light, but never get so pumped up in yourself to where you think that, that you're something. We're nothing. But do you trust God? So what do you mean, preacher? I mean this. If you are willing to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ... To call upon His holy name. Do you believe He's the Son of God? How many believe that? That's, I've never seen any problem with that. You've got to be brainwashed out of that. Most people have no problem believing the Lord Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe He died on the cross? Do you believe He was buried? And then He rose again the third day? No problem. Everybody believes that. No problem. But did you know there's a lot of people that believe that that aren't saved? They believe the truth about Christ, but they're not saved. Why aren't they, preacher? They're not 
trusting God. You have to trust Him to the point to where you're willing to give Him yourself and receive His Son and say, Oh God, the Lord Jesus is the only Savior. He's my Savior. There's no other Savior. i got no hope without Him. I don't know what words to say to you. I don't know how to get spiritual or theological. But I need Jesus. You take Him into your bosom and you receive Him. He, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. So I receive Him. Yes, Lord. God, give me, give me the Lord Jesus. Help me. Save me. Whatever words come out of your mouth is your mouth. But you're taking the Son. Now here's the next point. You're saying the devil comes along and says, Now, yes, you, you didn't mean that. You said that before. Just words. And you say back to the devil, Hold on, liar. I meant every word I said. Every word I said I meant. And he can't lie. And I'm taking him at his word. And I'm trusting God with my soul. You're a liar, devil. Get thee hence. You say, is salvation that simple? It's that simple. It's that simple. If you're ready this morning to acknowledge what God says you are and what He's done for you, if you're willing to acknowledge that right now, you can come down here, you can walk out this door, get in the field out here in the back, you can go wherever you want to go, and you can get on your knees before God, and you can receive the Son of God into your soul, cling to Him, embrace Him, and God will save you. That's His promise. That's His character. And that's His Word. Father, in Thy name I pray. I've tried my best. To put this out in a simple fashion, where there be no doubt anybody could understand it. Lord, my purpose, you know what it is. You know what this was all about with me this morning. My purpose was to lay out in a simple way what it takes to be saved. In Jesus' name I pray, Father. I pray for every young person. pray for anybody in this house. There might be somebody here 75 years old got a hold of this and they want to be born again. Hallelujah to God. It doesn't matter to me what age. Just get the truth out. And I've given it, Father. I've got peace. In Jesus' name we pray.